Good morning. My name is Scott Lee, and I am an alcoholic. It's in the book, Chainsaw. Yeah. yeah. I love it. If, those of you who can't see the shirt here in the front row is our friend from Nashville. Chainsaw might get one of his talks, by the way. He's wearing our, our Cliff Roach shirt. It's, it's got the a circle on the triangle that says, shut up, get in the car. <laughs> Cliff, Cliff said he thought that was the first step for his first six months. Shut up, get in the car. <laughs> yeah. So we had shirts made. <laughs> anyway, what, it's an honor, and, and thanks to Lee and to uh, Lee for having the idea, and probably to John and Ralph for doing all the work to uh, to, to make this thing happen. Uh, Andrew, I think I might have left out, but um, I am real honored, and, and what a privilege for me to have the chance to talk on step four, which is a real passion for me. Um, but I would, I would like to open, like I, I try to open everything I do with a quotation from Lois Wilson, who said in the moment of silence before the serenity prayer that she took, uh, took a few moments and invited God to the meeting. And uh, my, my great teacher told me that he had learned to treat God like a gentleman, and it's his experience that gentlemen did not go where they weren't invited, and they didn't stay where they weren't made welcome. So if you would, let's just take a moment and literally invite God to join us and bless us with open hearts. Amen. Thank you. Uh, when I got to you, what I was trying to do was I was trying to work the promises and hope the steps came true. <laughs> my, that's, my history is to try to pretend to be what I think you want me to be. And then you guys were reading these nine-step promises. I thought, okay, that's who I'm supposed to be here. So I tried to be that. And, um, and it was making me pretty crazy. And um, I eventually fell into the hands of a big book thumper who sponsored me, and he told me that I was too sick to stay sober on the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I would have to have the program also. And which, you know, I had zipped through a 28-day treatment program in six weeks flat and, um, <laughs> and just thought I knew a whole lot, and I didn't have any idea what he was talking about. And, uh, and Jerry said at the end of his life he thought the best-kept secret in our fellowship Definition of the program. How do we keep it secret? Well, we read it at just almost every meeting. Uh, it's read here today on, uh, on page 59. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. He said the steps aren't part of the program. They are the program. No steps, no program. That simple. Just that simple. He said don't drink and go to meetings. You'll die from that. That'll kill you. That the steps of the program, it's to dig the poison out of your soul. And... Uh, so without diverging too far into my own story, I'm going to get, try to get focused on the first portion of step four. Um, and so this, the, the, the only way I know how to present this is how I take a new guy through the step. And a new guy is defined someone who has just asked me to sponsor him. It could be somebody that has more time than I do. I, I get to do that every once in a while. doesn't matter how much time he's got. If he's just asked me to sponsor him, he's a new guy as far as I'm concerned. Because I, I'm a one-trick pony. I'm going to take him through the steps. All I know how to do. So the uh, the scene is he has just completed. He has just done his third step prayer. And we're coming up off of our knees, and uh, I say to him, "You will probably hear if you haven't yet the discussion raging in our fellowship as to when to do a four step." And I've heard people say, "Don't do a four step too soon. You may drink." I never ha never have seen that. I've seen several thousand wait too late. Um, <laughs> And you'll hear people say, do one step a year, but they can't tell me what page that's on. The, um, the, the book is not specific about when to do a four-step. It actually makes two time references, and I give all the leeway that the book gives. So we'll use either of those two time references or anything that lies between them. Does that seem fair to you? That seems fair, right? So I say, begin reading for me at the bottom of page 63, and he reads next. I say, whoa, that's the time reference. So we've just come up off of our knees from doing the third step prayer. It says, next, we launched a course of vigorous action. First step is a personal house cleaning, which many of us have never attempted. Though our decision, that's the third step decision, we decided. Third step is clearly not where we turn our will and lives over to God or over to the care of God. If it were, we'd have a three-step program. And the directions for accomplishing the decision numbered 4 through 12. According to my sponsor, it said it was a decision was a vital, vital meaning necessary to life, and crucial step. It could have little, per, little permanent effect unless at once. Wait, that's a time reference. 
So the fourth step is either done next or at once or anywhere in between. And I'm going to let you choose. I'll give you all of the leeway the book gives you. You'll find I'm very easy. Followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of. Isn't that interesting? In step four, we're going to be rid of. Matter of fact, we're going to be rid of twice on this page. They're going to tell us to be rid of. I make an observation. When you do step four, if all you do is write, you will be rid of ink, paper, and time. <laughs> and I'll be astounded to find out that any of those are blocking you. So there must be things other than writing involved in step four. We're getting clues here. To be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us, therefore we started upon a personal inventory step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Most of the businesses that I have dealt with in my business career, uh, especially over the last 15 years, they do a computer update every night, which for me is the evening portion of step 11. But once a year, sometimes twice, but once a year, they do a full teardown inventory. That's the reference that I take from that. And in, in my 23 years, I think I've done 24 steps. The, the last one was on an airplane in about 40 minutes. If I do what I'm told on a regular daily basis, I don't wind up with a lot of poison in my soul. And when I go through the process again, I find it rather quickly and discard it rather quickly. My first few four steps did not take 40 minutes. Um, Let's see. It's an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object to disclose damage or unsaleable goes to get rid of. Twice they've told us. Get rid of them promptly without regret. We did the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our, make which caused, our makeup, which caused our failure. That's the good news. That's what my sponsor told me when we were actually a page before on page 62. He said, would you like to have some good news? I said, I would. He said, would you like to have the best news you're ever going to get in your whole life? I said, yes, I would. He said, it's right here on page 62. Get ready. Here it comes. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. Was that it, Jerry? <laughs> yeah, that was it. I don't get it. <laughs> he said, the good news is that you're the problem, because if it really is the cops, the courts, the Russians, the Chinese, the PTA, and the ex-wife, you know, if it really is them, you're cooked, son. We can't do a thing about them. The good news is that you're the problem. And if you'll bring a little willing to this, willingness to this party, we can work on that. And then he defined willingness for me. He said, willingness is when you do what your sponsor says, whether you want to or not. <sighs> Man was very difficult to deal with. And uh, <laughs> saved my life. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure. Being convinced itself, manifested in various ways, was what had defeated us. We considered its common manifestations. Can I see the hands of the people in this room who have never done a four-step? Come on, I know you're here. Fantastic. Fantastic. Welcome. Let me tell you something. Step four is one of the easiest steps we got. It's just maybe a little bit on the long side. But let, let's be honest about it. There are no surprises. You did all that. Okay? Nothing to be afraid of here. You're the one that did this stuff. Um, the, um, the, the second piece on that that's so important, this is what he told me. He said all that stuff in your past that you did that makes you sick to think about it. He said, that's not who you are. That's who you're not. Because if that's who you are, you're still out there doing it, and it doesn't make you sick to think about it. What we will teach you here is how to quit doing who you're not, how to repair the damage for doing who you're not, how to receive the forgiveness for doing who you're not, and who you really are will emerge from the ashes like the phoenix. That's what's going to happen here if you will just go through this process with us. That in step four, we're going to begin to dig the poison out of your soul. And that is precisely what this thing is about. So, you know, I, think you, I think he told me if I tried to do this without someone who would already done it for a coach, that what I would wind up with was a searchless and fearing moral inventory. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's right. And uh, the directions are pretty specific on, on how to do it. And I'm going to cover a few. I count about 26, and I'm kind of a technician, and I don't apologize for that. It's working for me. Um, so we start looking for, um, looking for directions on, on what do I do. It says at the bottom of 64, resentment is the number one offender. Number one offender. It destroys. I wonder if that's a problem. It, it destroys 
more alcoholics than anything else, and I have watched that recently close to me. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease. We've been not only mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. makes me think the spiritual one is the one that matters. Then it says, in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Aha! That, to me, is a general description. They're going to tell me exactly how to set it on paper. It said, we listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we are angry. He said, a list is a series of words and phrases that run down a page. I don't believe I've ever seen a list that ran across a page. <laughs> list, think about your last grocery list. They run down pages they don't run across. Calls for a list. And what we need now is a list. And then he said, uh, you're probably wondering what color ink and what color paper you should use. Were you wondering that? I think I said no, but I might have said yes. I don't know, about half of them will say yes. He said, the book's not specific about that. Over here on 67, it says we placed them before us in black and white. That's, that's not very specific. Well, it doesn't say black ink and white paper. It could easily be black ink and, or black paper and white ink. Easily. Um, I've sponsored two so far who, uh, who went to the art store and got black paper and pens that wrote white ink. And uh, one of them's over 18 years now. Um, and, and, I th- and I require it. That, uh, be, be, I want that attitude. Because I don't care what the book says. We're going to do it. I don't care how small the detail is. We're going to follow it. And uh, I require them, if I sponsor them, to work on white paper with black ink or black paper on, with white ink. We go either way. Or pencil. Black, dark pencil will do as well. And I think that's ridiculous. And I require it. And uh, the, uh, I, think the easy way, I think the easy way is to get a spiral notebook at the drugstore for about a buck forty-nine, like so. And uh, on the inside cover, you want to write something subtle, like, this is my four-step, put it down. If I find you with it, I will kill you and hide your body. <laughs> something, something subtle and yet to carry the spiritual message that you're trying to convey. <laughs> I, I think that's a good choice. And then, and then, we, and then we need a list. And, uh, and now I want to talk about, um, I don't want you to take on completing a four-step. It's not your assignment. Um, when I sat to do my first one, I gave myself the assignment of completing a four-step, and it made me in perfect position to hate me till it was done. Wrong assignment. The assignment I want is for you and I to agree on how much time, based on what we both know about your life, how much time we sh- you should commit to your four-step e- each week. And it may vary week to week, but uh, we need to agree on that. And then you need to make appointments with me as to when you're going to do it. I'm not going to be there. But then you make appointments with me, and and it's like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a half hour. That's not an appointment. Monday from 5 p.m. until 5.30 p.m. is an appointment. And I want you to call me every Sunday with them. So let's set this up and keep it in motion. And then all of a sudden, you know, the wife and kids are going to be out of town, and you've got a Saturday all by yourself, and you want to kill yourself with it? Great, have a good time. But I don't believe that, that recovery from, from alcoholism should, should have a negative impact on any other aspect of my life. It should be real inconvenient at times. But it should not hurt me at my job. It should not hurt me with my family. It should not hurt me with my church. And uh, so let's agree on it because, I mean, here's the situation. Let's say you've got a 40-hour-a-week job and a 30-minute commute. That's 45 hours gone. If you sleep eight hours a night, that's 56 more. Uh, Fifteen hours for uh, a week for meetings, that's a meeting a day with some drive time. Three hours for recreation, maybe some tennis around the golf. Uh, two hours mowing the lawn and doing your melon list. You know, honey, do this. You know the melon list. And um, five hours reading spiritual literature. Um, I require the guys I sponsor to read two pages a day in the basic text. We just start at the beginning and just read two pages a day to 164 and just keep it coming. That's the only way you can find the new stuff. And, uh, and the people who read the book often are laughing now because I swear you read it with new spiritual eyes, you find stuff that wasn't there before. Um, three hours a week to bathe, shave, take care of yourself. Four hours for a date with your wife if you're fortunate enough to still have one. Um, or maybe coach a little league team. Five hours on the phone with me and some men whose names and numbers I will give you. 12 hours a week to cook and eat food, one hour to shop for groceries and clothes, get a haircut, five hours a week in prayer and meditation, nine hours a week watching TV, that's three ball games, that's enough. (laughs) 
That's 165 hours. A week has 168 hours in it. You got three hours left. I want half. So that's that's sort of the rule of thumb I, uh, that I work with, and I think a 30-minute period is a pretty good way to go. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from uh, from five to five thirty, and all, you say, "Oh my goodness, I didn't know my son had the little league game, and you have to slip it till nine o'clock that night." I don't even need a phone call. But like anything else that's on your calendar that's important, it's not subject to cancellation. Might be moved occasionally. Uh, or your boss comes into town, you're going to be with him all week long, and you're not going to great on the front end. My experience as a sponsor is that I get reasons on the front end, I get excuses on the back end. Catch me on the front. I do better with it. Um, you're not going to do the perfect four-step. You have my permission not to do the perfect four If you have to do the perfect four-step, you can't do one at all. And besides, this isn't your four-step. This is your next four-step, your first four-step. We're going to be doing If I sponsor you, you'll be taking a newcomer through this work and doing it yourself again within a year. So you don't have to get it all. You have to try to, but you don't have to get it all. And I'll show you how I try to keep somebody moving through that thing. I, and I tell them, we are not saving a special alcove in Akron at the AA Hall of Fame for your four-step. <laughs> in addition to which, our home group does not give a trophy every year for the very best four-step. And this is the trophy you are not going to get. <laughs> for those who can't read it, it says, four-step trophy never awarded. You can have your picture made with us later for a very small fee. <laughs> I show them the trophy. Some get it, some don't. But, but, but the point is, the point is, if you have to do it perfectly, you can't do it at all. So let's get out there and do a lousy first four step. Fantastic. Boy, isn't that better than not doing one at all? You bet it is. Yeah. Permission to make a mistake. Permission to be human. So powerful. So now we've established that you've got your white paper and black ink or whatever alternative you came up with, and, uh, and you're sitting down to do your first session. And we found the first direction was we listed, that's a list is a series of words and phrases run down a page, we listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. So I need now a list of everybody you've ever been angry with if this is your first four step. And uh, what I have you do is, is consider the two pages when you, the inside cover has got the uh, the little subtle spiritual thing about put this down, and then and by the way after he gets started on it as soon as possible I give him his grade it's a red F minus, you know it's one more you ain't gonna do it perfect thing, I always give him an F minus as soon as, as soon as he gets started writing I grade it for him, and uh, they all get that that's that's the way that's what I get because you're gonna have to do it again, and uh, and so we write one two three four. The left-hand page is one and two, one over the left-hand margin, two in the middle, and three and the uh, four split the right-hand page. Because the way I understand to do this, what I, what I like to do, and I, let me tell you something. If your sponsor disagrees with me, I agree with your sponsor. Your sponsor's right and I'm wrong in your case. I mean that with all my heart. And I'm not here to tell you how to do this. I'm here to tell you how I do it. Um, and I, I think your, I, I hope your sponsor's final authority on your program. Mine is on mine. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to write a name, skip a line, write a name, skip a line, write a name, skip a line, and just spew them just as fast as you can think of them. Anybody, anything you have ever been angry with, just go ahead and list all your family members. Trust me, just put them down. <laughs> A couple of foreign countries, at least one major political... It's election year. It's a good year for a four-step. At, le at, least, at least one major political party, some major political figures, um, high school teachers, high school... Sweet, you know, just write a name, skip a line, write a name, skip a line. Now, for those of you who are thinking, nah, the skip a line thing. See, you who've cheated and looked ahead and know that the second direction has to do with what they did, and you're planning to save ten pages for your father, the answer is write a name, skip a line. Do not write a name the second time. I'll show you why. Get to the bottom of the page. Got to turn the page. Can't write on the right-hand page. We're going to need that. And then write one, two, three, four across the top and just keep them coming. When they slow down, when you can sit for 15, 20 seconds and not think of one, let's do what it says at the bottom of 65. It says we went back through our lives. So that, it, that indicates that we use what I call a reverse chronology. We begin with today. 
All right, I'm married to this fabulous woman, and we live in this place, and I work for these guys, and this is my home group, and these are my social activities. But 18 years ago, I was married to, uh, and uh, I lived in that place, you know, and then before that I was there, and before that I was in the Air Force. I was stationed at this place, and then I was at that one. Well, let's go back through my life slowly, searching for anything or anyone I have ever been angry with. And the answer is yes, it's going to be a long list. Uh, the shortest list I've ever seen I thought was complete was around 45 or 50. It was a young man, and he just wasn't that angry. And uh, the longest list I ever saw, and it was incomplete, was over 600. Yeah, this guy hated everybody, and he wished there was more of them. Uh, <laughs> he was amazing, and uh, I didn't get him through the work. He, he, he wouldn't do it, but... Um, and when we get to your earliest memories, we're finished with column one. Is it complete? No. Are we finished with it? Yes. And at this point, I want you to carry a piece of paper and a, and a writing instrument with you all the time because you're going to be walking through the grocery store. You're going to look at the candle up and say, oh, his head look, just, just write it down. <laughs> we'll add it to the end of the list. So we're at your earliest memories. We're finished with that portion. And then it says, we asked ourselves why we're angry. We take a look at the uh, example on the right-hand page. I'm resentful at Mr. Brown, the cause. Hmm. His attention to my wife. Told my wife of my mistress. Brown may get my job at the office. And what I have them do is begin with office and count backwards. If they go forward, they never get the right number. Count backwards, you'll find there are 19 words under there. Take a look at what Mr. Brown did. He's messing with this guy's old lady. Has, by the way, told the old lady about his girlfriend and is trying to get him fired. He got 19 words. 19's all you're getting. 19 words, that's it. That's what the example uses. That'll be enough. Because we're not, we're not going to say, we're not going to start. It was a rainy Wednesday afternoon. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, you're trying to feed the resentment. I'm trying to excise it. We're trying to dig it out of there. It's a summary. All right? It says, uh, so column two will say things like, left me for another guy, uh, fired me, um, left me for another guy, uh, didn't play me as much as I deserved next to high school, high school football coach, um, left me for another guy. There are patterns. Um, <laughs> you may notice some. And um, 19 words or less. And you have got from, from the margin to the spiral on the same line that the name is on and the line below it from the margin to the spiral on which you can like write 19 words or less. Now, I'll admit there may be some cases where somebody's done more to you than this Mr. Brown fellow has done in our example. If you've got somebody that you think has done more than that and you need to write the 20th word, call me. I'll be glad to talk to you about it. We'll negotiate. I'll be happy to. I, I'll tell you, I've never given up the 20th word. I'm willing to talk about it. I'll tell you the rest of it. I've never been called. You wouldn't call me, would you? <laughs> no, they don't either. <laughs> they get it. Because that's not what we're here for. Not what we're here for. I, I got a phone call one Sunday afternoon from a girl in my home group, and she said, she said, I'm crazy. I said, what's the matter? She said, I had a fight with my boss on Friday, and I've been four-stepping about it all weekend. No, she hadn't. She's been taking his inventory, hating him on paper all weekends, what she's been doing, and it's making her crazy. Yeah, uh -huh. all right. On our grudge list, we said opposite each name our injuries. Was it our five-part multiple choice, self-esteem, security, ambition, personal, or sex relations? Some get one, some get two or three, some get all five, some you may not be able to figure out. Call me. Call me. I'll help you see why it was self-esteem. Well, on your first one, it's going to be. Um, my first 15 or so were all self-esteem, got almost all the ink, and the last two or three have been security. It was interesting to see the, the change. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm this age against long odds. I didn't expect to get to here. I don't have any plans. Um, anyway, for me, the power in this portion of the fourth step lies between the third and fourth columns. It is the observations and prayers that come on this next page and a half that are life-changing. I don't know that the writing portion of step four has any effect at all. 
But what we're about to go into for me is the meat of this thing. It's the, po- it's the thing that changed my life. It's the thing that dug the poison out of my soul. Bottom of 65, we went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. So we're, they're, now they're going to tell us how to consider it. They, they don't leave me alone to do that. That's good. I should have an adult with me if I'm going to consider something like that carefully. It says, the first thing apparent was that this world and the people were often quite wrong. I don't let them spend much time on that. The chances are he's been on bar stools with some of the other great philosophers of our era for the last 20 years doing this very thing, and so it won't be necessary to give this a lot of time. Um, conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. Is that true for you? The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes with remorse, we were sore at ourselves. Did you have that? The more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got us in war. The victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Was that your experience? And then it says, it is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. Is that plain to you? This is a sales presentation. That's what, to me, that's what this page is, and I'll show you what I'm talking about in a minute. But it, they say this was plain to them. Now, when I agree to sponsor you, I ask you to commit to this. If the big book says they wrote something, you will stop and write it. If they say they've prayed something, you will stop and pray it. If they say that they observe something, you will stop and endeavor to observe it. You may or may not be able to, but you will try to observe it. They observe that any life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappy. Have you ever seen a life that was full of deep resentment and happy, joyous, and free? (laughs) It's an interesting perspective. To the precise extent that we permit these, that's resentments, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? Did you ever sit in class and hate them? Hmm? When you should have been listening? Did you ever do that? Did you ever lay awake at night and plan what you were going to do to them instead of, instead of sleeping? Did you ever do that? Okay. So did you squander to throw away with no hope of getting anything positive back? Did you squander hours that might have been worthwhile? Did you do that? You're going to have to forgive me, but I'm about medium rare. Linda and I went to Hong Kong. I always wanted one with a red lining. Um, to the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? But with the alcoholic whose hope, now they're going to tell me what my hope is, the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience. I believe growth means that I must continue to stay in a growth mode, that uh, I, ne- I need to continue to be searching for the new truths, for the new things about me that need to be changed. And I believe maintenance means two things. Maintenance means in the sense that I can't lose anything I've already got. And it also means that um, maintenance in the sense that I maintenance my vehicle. I rotate the tires. I got the front end aligned. I change the oil, that kind of thing. I maintenance my spiritual experience. Prayer, meditation, carrying meetings into the jail, sponsoring God. It says, we found that this business of resentment is infinitely grave. Infinitely grave. We just threatened your life. We're going to do it a lot. <laughs> that was just once. Here it is again. We found it as fatal. And um, I tell this story. I, I ran into the fellow. I hadn't seen this guy in a couple of years, the man that took me through the work the first time. And I ran into him in a clubhouse. And I, I said, i got to ask you something. I, something troubling me greatly. I said, do you remember? And I named a guy. And he said, if anybody you sponsor ever commits suicide, you'll always remember them. And I said, I can't find the difference between me and him. He and I had a two-year chip. We were plus or minus a month or so on the same sobriety date. We had the same home group where I saw him many times each week. We had the same sponsor, you. And he drove home one night from a meeting two years sober and pulled into the garage and dropped the door and left it running. And I can't find the difference between me and him, and I'm scared. And I sit here with a six-year chip in my pocket. What's the difference, Jerry? And he said I could not get him to do a four-step, and he died of resentment killed him. And I thought about it, and I've talked to some other people who knew us all in that era, and everyone agrees. This guy, every time he saw you, he could not wait to run up and tell you what some SOB had just done to him. And he would not lay it down, and the victims don't get sober. He would not go through the forgiveness process, and, and it killed him. I stand by that. I watched. We just killed you twice. For when harboring such feelings, doesn't say when having. I, I love the language in the text. It doesn't say when having such feelings. It says when harboring. Harbor means to give a safe place to, to nurture. I'm okay if I have a resentment if I'm not harboring it. They're going to tell me how to not harbor in a couple of minutes. We shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns. We drink again with us. To drink is to... Ah, we killed you again. 
If we were to live, this is only for the ones that want to live. Everybody else go ahead and take a break. Um, we just killed you again four times. We had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. Maybe the most misunderstood sentence in the book. About the time this book was being written, I'm told, a very creative guy, not too, well, he wasn't here at that time. Walt Disney said his people around him were writing Mickey Mouse cartoons, and he came up with a concept where people had spit out ideas, and he, he labeled his process brainstorming. has absolutely nothing to do with the word brainstorm in the text. We've got some 1930s dictionaries that we work in. And brainstorm says transient, violent, mental outburst. That's rage. That's rage. It has nothing to do with the creative process. So for our purposes, there are two kinds of anger. There is the grouch, the slow burn, and the brainstorm, the detonation, rage. I hope that helped. It helped me. They may, is this thin? They may be the dubious luxury for normal men. But for alcoholics, these things are poison. We just killed you again. Uh, we turn back to the list for it held the key to the future. We're killing you subtly here. Does that mean if I don't find the key to the future, I don't have a future? Yes. That's what that means. Thanks for asking. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. Different from what? Well, the last time we looked at the list, we have not been looking at the list at all. We haven't written anything. We've been making some very important observations on how serious resentment is. The last time we looked at the list was at the bottom of the preceding page. The first thing apparent was this world that people were often quite wrong. So it's asking me now to be prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. What's different from that? And that's that, am I capable on a, on a spiritual bad hair day of doing what those people did? If I had his history, if I'd grown up with his father, if I'd been in the same pressure cooker he was in, if whatever was going on with him at that time, if I had lived that, could I have done what he did? Literally to walk across the courtroom from, from the prosecution table and sit down at the defense. That's what I'm asked to do here. It's a powerful thing to stop and prepare myself to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. And I like to stop and just look at this thing. How did this dominate you? Take a look through your list and how did this dominate you? Uh, did your father beat you down so hard that at 64 years old you still have trouble occasionally with authority figures? That's my story. Did, uh, did you plan your life so you'd never be near this person so they couldn't get you again? Did you plan your life so you'd be near them as much as you could so if they screwed up you could make sure everybody found out? Man, how, how did these things dominate you? Let's have a look at that. Let's maybe take a 30-minute session and have a look at how these things dominated your life. In that state, the wrongdoings of others fancied or real. Fancied? Does that mean some of this only happened in my head? Mm-hmm. Had the power to actually kill, just for fun. How could we escape? Now, there's the, there's the question. How could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered. I think that's one of the most important observations in the book, Do You? I'm a salesman by trade. That's what I do. A good salesman will never mention price till he's established value. We just killed you seven times on one page. Have we established value to the point where you don't care what the price is, you will pay it? I hope so, because the price is high. <laughs> It says, um, we could not wish them away any more than alcohol. I can't wish my resentments away. What that says to me and what my experience is, I don't have the power to forgive. I think the English language got the word forgive all wrong. It's not something I do. It's something I receive. Let me talk about it. This was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. My teacher told me that spirit, he defined spiritually sick as cut off from God. He said, think about the one or two worst things you ever did right now. I said, okay. He said, weren't you cut off from God to have done those things by your own hand? Hadn't you turned your back on him? Had you been walking in the sunlight of the Spirit in conscious contact with this gentle, laughing God that created the galaxies and the duckbill platypus, could you have done that? No, no. You were spiritually sick. And these people who wronged you were spiritually sick because spiritually healthy people don't do that kind of thing to God's kids. They don't do it. They were spiritually sick. This is the beginning of the forgiveness process. Another one of my teachers says it this way, if you watch my hands. He says, we, we realized. I can know something, but when I realize it, it becomes what Miss Linda calls heart knowledge. That I've got to get it to a different level. I must realize it. 
so that I can see it with my real eyes. Not these, but my spirit eyes. That's what this has to be. It says, though we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us. All right, the symptom of their spiritual sickness is whatever they did left me with a resentment. The way they disturbed me is my resentment. They, like ourselves, were sick too. Gee, that must be important. They've just told us twice in two sentences. These are sick people just like me. Just sick people just like me. We ask God. That looks very much like a prayer. We ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. Um, I had a lot of trouble with this next part that I'm going to bring to you until I, I finally made peace with something further back in the book. I'm going to read it and talk about it. Most of my mentors got sober on the second edition. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. I, I consider the story section to be the more will be disclosed section. And uh, although several of my mentors uh, are not fond of what I'm about to do, I have to do it because I saw it work for me, and it is in my text today. And that's the story of freedom from bondage. Um, this is page 551. And by the way, I'm carrying a fourth edition. I require the men I sponsor to carry fourth editions. Most of us got sober on the third, but our newcomers are carrying fourth editions. They're confused enough. The, new, the Roman numerals don't match up. Don't do it to them, all right? Bottom of 551. One morning, however, I realized I had to get rid of it. That's a, a um, resentment against her mother. For my reprieve, if you look that up, it's a, st- a reprieve is a stay of execution. I'm an alcoholic. I'm under death sentence. My reprieve was running out. If I didn't get rid of it, I was going to get drunk, and I didn't want to get drunk anymore. In my prayers that morning, I asked God to point out to me some way to be free of this resentment. During the day, a friend of mine brought me some magazines to take to a hospital group I was interested in. I looked through them. A banner across one featured an article by a prominent clergyman in which I caught the word resentment. I want to observe the the sequence of events because I believe it's a predictable sequence. Item one, she sees something about herself that needs work. Item two, she prays about it. And I like to add in three, talk to a sponsor, spiritual advisor. That's not what was here. And then item, the next item is that she got busy helping somebody else. She took magazines in to help a hospital group, whatever that looks like. It's getting out of yourself, helping somebody else. And her answer fell out of the sky on her. It is a predictable sequence of events. That will happen over and over again. And, And I try to point it out when I see it in the men I sponsor, when I see it happen for me. Got something going on. Pray about it, talk to somebody about it, get focused helping somebody else, get through helping them, you come out, the answer is laying on the hood of the car. It, it just, you can bet it. He said, in effect, if you have a resentment you want to be free of, that's a good question. Do you want to be free of it? Did we make our sale? We killed you seven times. If you'll pray for the person, the thing you resent, you'll be free. If you ask in prayer everything you want for yourself to be given to them, you'll be free. Ask their health, prosperity, their happiness, and you'll be free. Even when you don't really want it for them and your prayers are only words and you don't mean it, go ahead and do it anyway. He goes on to say that'll work in two weeks. That hadn't been my experience. You start with 194 resentments, it ain't going to be done in two weeks. Um, and what I, like to, what I like to do at this point is I like to add that prayer to the Sullivan. Because what I'm doing is I'm praying for them in that prayer. This one on 67, I'm asking God to help me show him tolerance, pity, and patience. And that, so, so now we're still working 30-minute sessions. And I want you to sit for the first five minutes of this one in prayer and meditation. And I want you to talk to God about the three or four worst things you've ever done. And I want you to tell him that you're sad that you did that and that you were cut off from him by your own hand. And it was your fault and it wasn't his. And that you crave his forgiveness. And I want to put you in a position to pray this. And then you start with the first name on the list. It says, first name on the list, Fred. God, please help me show Fred the same tolerance, pain, and patience I would cheerfully grant a sick friend. And I, I pray that Fred gets promoted at work and that he wins the Tennessee lottery and uh, his kids go to school on scholarship and don't give him any trouble. And his, his wife is a fabulous lover and his lawn grows lush and green, but it grows so slowly he only has to mow it once a year. Uh, just hang it right out over the edge. Uh, just the more creative you can get on there. He has a big spiritual experience and walks in the sunlight and founds, founds a church and millions are saved. Just don't leave anything in the bag on this. And, um, and then when you finish the prayer, and it takes 30 seconds, maybe a minute at the most, 
Simple, simple yes or no question. I mean that, I don't mean it. Yes or no question? This is not a discussion question. This is a yes or no question. If the answer is no, move on to the next name. If the answer is yes, put a check mark. Move on to the next name. Not at all unusual to pray the whole list two or three times and not check a one. Doesn't matter. I don't care how long this takes. If we do something more important than this, I don't know what it is. I don't know. This is just a little bit more important than life or death. We, we pray a prayer at the end of an awful lot of meetings, and there's a phrase in that that says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. And I believe what that says is, God, if I don't forgive them, don't you forgive me. This is just a little bit more important than life or death. And my experience is that I don't have the power to forgive. That, that forgive isn't something I do, it's something I receive. And I think of resentment as ice around my heart. And the ice has the thickness in each case, I think, based on the severity of the events and also based on how long ago they were and how much I've nurtured uh, the, uh, the resentment. But there's a thickness. And what I do with this is I hold that icy heart up to the sunlight of the Spirit, and sunlight will melt ice. just takes some time. And usually when they start breaking loose, they break loose really good. Bre- breaks a bunch of them. Don't let me leave you confused. I'm not asking you to approve of anything anybody did. Not asking for approval. Acceptance does not have to include approval. All right? Acceptance is when I stop on a heart level fighting something over which I have no power. That's what acceptance is. It's when I quit squandering my own spiritual energy on any given day. That's what acceptance is. I don't have to approve of it. For those of you who were abused as children, I'm sad that happened to you. That's not right. It's not ever going to be right. I'm really sorry that, that, that you went through that. Um, I know it's been a burden. It's, a, it's just a really, really sick thing, and I'm very, very sorry that that had to happen. I'm not asking you to approve of that. I don't approve of it either. But I know this, because I was abused as a child, and I know that I had to get free of that, because I can't afford the price of hating them, because it will kill me. It will kill me. I can't have much interest in what you think about me. What I think about you can kill me. That's what this is about. This is about freeing me. And uh, if I sponsor you, we're going to do this till the list is all checked off, and I really don't care how long it takes. Somewhere between two and a half and about five months is about average. And we're doing 30-minute sessions three times a week or more, and I want you praying in the shower, driving the car, whenever you can think of it. Let's stay in prayer on this thing, and let's hold this icy heart up to the sunlight of the Spirit, and let's, let's get you free of this. My sponsor said, you got here, and what you wanted was mercy for you and justice for everybody else. <laughs> and the package is mercy for everybody or justice for everybody. You are part of everybody, and you get to choose. I can't face justice. I can't face it. And so I've chosen mercy for everybody. I had to. And it freed me. Uh, I don't know if it changed them at all, but I got free. And I was the one that needed to get free. Continuing with the top of 67, it says, When a person offended, we said to ourselves, This to me is my marching orders from here on. This is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. So that's what I'm supposed to do when you bug me right now. Shame on you. Um, It says, we avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people. At least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Is that a powerful promise? It kind of reminds me of of this thing. They they changed. Most of you are probably familiar with this quotation at the top top of page 77. Well, they changed it about a year and a half ago. Do you know what I mean? When you're, you're reading through this book, you know they haven't changed it, and yet there's something new there. Well, they changed this in about, it was in, um, it says, Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. The part they slipped in on me was to fit ourselves. My job isn't to be a maximum service, it's to fit myself to be a maximum service. He's going to use me if I can make myself the best tool I can be. My job is to sharpen me, is to work on my case. Not to be out there and be a maximum service. I'll be used. Mm-hmm. Now, I need to be available, but uh, I can't shut that. In the meantime, I can't be hating you and be of service to you also. I mean, 
Come to me and tell me that you want to be my friend, spend time together, and by the way, you hate some of my children. Does that make any sense? These are God's kids. I can't afford the price of hating them. It says, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, I don't know how I could possibly do that if I still hate them. And I think that's why it was so important for me to do all those prayers first, was to get that particular portion of poison out of my soul so that, so that I could do that. Because if I still hate you, I can't think about you and not have that flair. It says, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. I'd like to observe it does not say we look for our own part. I, I, I just think that it's awful. It doesn't say that. If I'm looking, a friend of our, actually a, a fellow that Clancy sponsors showed this to me. If I'm looking for my part, here's, here's my part right here. Do you see my part? Do you see, that, do you see that I have a part here? Can you see my part right here? I do have a part. If I'm looking for my part, that's what I'm seeing here. If I have been through this forgiveness process, there are no parts. Nobody else has a part. I'm looking for my mistakes. Where had we been? Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? That is a list that runs all over this book. Um, on, on, page, on page 69 that uh, Polly's going to cover for us here in a few minutes. Selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate. On, uh, on page 84 in the tenth step, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Page 86 in step 11, where we, we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid. Page 88, where then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. Page 145, and the, this is just a, a few of them. Just a few. The greatest enemies, we have enemies of us alcoholics, are resentment, jealousy, envy, frustration, and fear. And all of those things have to do with the reemergence of self. But this thing is about getting self pushed back down to its right size. And that when I get involved, selfish is I want it my way and I really don't care how it affects you. Dishonest is actually me playing God. I'm making the outcome come out the way I think it should come out. Self-seeking is I just want it my way and frightened is I'm afraid I may not get it my way. So these are all about self. Though a situation not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. They tell me that twice. Hard to do if I still hate them. Were we to blame the inventory was ours, not the other man's? I like to use a fourth column on that. doesn't leave you much room. We're not here for self-flagellation. It's to write down what were my mistakes, very simply. And what that does is, is it sets up step eight, which you'll find if you dig a little bit further back into the book. It says uh, we made it when we took step four. So don't burn your fourth step. I don't care what they say at the treatment center. You're going to need it. Because I initially thought when I did this part of the work, what I was making was a list of people who owed me an amends. I was wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> Gee, I was wrong about a lot of things. Um, so, so forgive isn't something I do. It's something I receive. Now, I got here locked up like this. And what you have taught me is to open myself up to receive the gifts that have always been here. It was never God's unwillingness to give. It's always been my inability to receive. And what this is about, for me, this portion, is about opening myself up to be able to receive the gift of not hating you anymore. Because that changes me. Um, I laugh more. I sleep better. I'm, I'm more comfortable in my own skin. I laugh easier. I'm more effective at work. My mind doesn't race like it once did. It, it literally, when I say dig poison out of your soul, I'm not being poetic. That's exactly, this is a soul sickness and... Uh, my sponsor had told me, he said, the program's kind of like going to the dentist. He says, we have to drill before we can fill. <laughs> this is some drilling. And uh, it's not that hard, but it's some drilling. And then it says, when we saw our faults, we listed them, we placed them before us in black and white. I think, quite sincerely, I think there are a lot of really good ways to do that paragraph. That's just, I just happened to use a fourth column. Uh, one of my mentors did it in sentence form. I've seen some of them use lists. I think there are a lot of great ways to do that. I think there are a lot of great ways to do all of this stuff. I think, I think when one of our members sits down with another one of our members with this book in their hand and read it a sentence at a time and do it to the best of their willingness, that's a gift from a, a friend of mine. I work this program to the best of my willingness. 
never to the best of my ability. But when we do that, we find these things and that they become alive for us and they change us. It says, we admitted our wrongs honestly and we're willing to set these matters straight. That does sound like step eight, doesn't it? We find that a little bit further on in, in, the, in this portion of the step. I didn't think I was going to have time to cover this. Like, can I take just a couple of more minutes? Um, as my, my sponsor, would, had, uh, I finally asked this guy to sponsor me, and he said, uh, he said, here's your first assignment. Said, assignment? You know, I thought a sponsor was like a new best friend to kind of show you around the neighbor, show you around the neighborhood, and uh, you know, introduce you to the right people, and loan you some money, maybe fix your wife, you know, some of that. <laughs> Wrong about a lot of things. And uh, he gave me an assignment. It took me a week, and I did it. And uh, I said, "Sponsor me," and I said, "I'll sponsor you my way." And I said, "What does that mean?" And he said, "You're too sick to stay sober on the fellowship. You'll need the program also." And he gave me the definition. He said he never had seen anybody in and out of the program. I never have either. I, I have never seen anyone actually do the steps. I, these are interchangeable for me. Do the steps, work the steps, take the steps. I really don't care what the action verb is. It's not learn the steps, believe the steps, or understand the steps. Or, oh, heaven, save us, not interpret the steps. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, but I never have seen anybody actually do the 12 steps out of this book while being coached by a sponsor who has already done the steps out of this book and stay active carrying our message and drink again. Has anybody ever seen that? I didn't think so. No. Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. Forward to the third edition says our path is the 12 steps. All right, this is not some get it, some don't, don't. This is some do it and some don't. This is a lock. This group has never seen that fail. There are a couple hundred people in here. I've asked that question to a good 100,000 AA members in the last 10 years. I've only seen five hands go up. I've asked them, please come talk to me. Only one lady came. And she, I said, you know somebody who did the steps out of the big book with a sponsor that had already done them out of the big book, stayed active and drank again. She said, well, no, he never did a four-step, actually. Oh. <laughs> Forgive me. I only, I only know of, of two, two men that I'm absolutely certain did the steps that drank again. I took them both through the work. I know they did it. One of them married his new higher power. And she did not like the amount of time he was spending in AA. I wonder how she likes him now. And uh, I'm sorry. I mean, that's it. Those are the rules. And, um, and the, uh, the other one's a hotel manager. She got a job in Arizona running a dude ranch 40 miles from the nearest AA meeting. It was two years with no contact with us. And he drank for a week, and he's sober over 10 years now. Those are the only two I know for sure that did this work, and they both backed out of step 12. They both stop carrying this message and doing what we do. This thing works for everybody. I'm here to sell you the steps. That's my job. Um, so anyway, he, uh, he said, you're going to do the 12 steps that the pace I set, the way I lay them out, I'm going to drop you like a bad habit. I don't work with losers. He scared me. Yeah, he scared me so bad I was honest with him. <laughs> I said, I don't want to do the 12 steps. He said, that's okay. I said, good. He said, as long as you do them. <laughs> I don't believe we're communicating. <laughs> he said, yeah, we are. That's the definition of willingness. Willingness when you do what your sponsor says, whether you want to. And I said, you ever try to get sober on your own? Yeah. How many times? I don't know. Give me a number. Give me a guess. 2,000. Jerry, I'm a puker. And I, you know, any pukers? Pukers in the room? Come on. Right. Did you tend to quit forever when you were puking? Yeah. How about out your nose? Did you quit every time forever when you puked out your nose? Right. And, he, yeah, and try, try and, and, and he said you tried to get sober on your own, and that was doing what you wanted to do and not doing what you didn't want to do. I said, well, yeah. He said that didn't work. So it must be to get sober, you'll have to do some things you'd rather not do and not do some things you kind of like to do. Well, and every time he took a breath, I said, why? <laughs> he said, I don't answer why questions to the men I sponsor except for this one. You get one why question, it's this one. And he said, the reason is, step one, section B says you ain't in management. Why is a management question? All of the questions begin with the word why have the same answer, and the answer is you don't need to know. Well, I hated that. And uh, today I love it. It's one of my, because I always thought it was not knowing that made me crazy. I was needing to know that it was making me crazy. 
<laughs> lay down the need to know, I don't have to be crazy anymore. And, uh, and he said, here's why you have to do the 12 steps. He said, think of yourself as a garbage can. It's the only easy assignment he ever gave me. <laughs> and uh, he says, what we'll do with these steps is dump you out, scrub the can, stand it back upright. We're going to fish through your life. Most of it's garbage. We're throwing it away. Portions are good. We'll keep them, for example. You love your kids? I said, a lot. He's great. We'll keep that. When we get finished with these 12 steps, you'll be empty, clean can, little good stuff in the bottom. The reason is because alcohol is not your problem. I thought Clancy made that so beautifully clear last night. <laughs> alcohol is not your problem. I said, what? He said, nah. He said, alcohol is your answer. Makes you tall enough, smart enough, good looking enough. You can talk to the girls. Fantastic dancer. Expert on many subjects. <laughs> right? I mean, this is a lubricant of life. So when we ask you to lay that down, we have not said put down your problem. We've said put down the only answer you have ever known. And to do that, the reason you can't do it on your own is because when you lay that down, you're now without an answer and you're the kind of guy who needs an answer. You'd have never been an alcoholic. So you're going to have to have a new answer. It's going to have to be at least as good as the old answer. And it is. And I found it. For those of you who are new, who have the experience of driving around town with a double white knuckle grip on the wheel to keep the car from pulling into the liquor store, <laughs> I know what that feels like. I hadn't felt it in over 23 years. I had my last urge sometime in December of 1984. I've been sober since June of 84. I don't remember the exact date. I remember the circumstances. I was somewhere in the step work the last time I had an urge. It's been gone that long. It's just not part. It's just not a factor for me, just like the book lays out. It's what happened to me in this process. I became changed. He said, the reason that you're going to need that big empty clean space, he says, one of these days something heavy just going to smack you in the heart. He said, your father's going to die. And on that day, if you don't have that big empty clean space, a little good stuff in the bottom, but if you don't have that big empty clean space to store that pain in while we love you back to spiritual health, you'll escape. And the only escapes you know are killing you and devastating everyone around you. And it's just that simple. And I finally ran out of wine. And I allowed the man to coach me through the 12 steps. Uh, they, you guys say one day at a time around here, Lee? One day at a time, they say that. Did, have they told you the second line? Under, under, underneath, the, for, for your new people, they're saying, one day at a time in a row. <laughs> Is actually what they're talking about. <laughs> If I'm going to stay sober one day at a time in a row, they're going to have to get me on Thursday. And uh, I think maybe the most powerful promise in the book is on page 60. It says 12. Having had a spiritual awakening is the result of these steps. It doesn't say a result. You'll hear it read that way. It's not what it says. A is one of several or one of many. The is singular. We, have, we promise you one result of these steps. You will have a spiritual awakening. It's my experience that spiritually awakened alcoholics do not drink beverage alcohol, and they don't ever get thirsty, no matter what. Uh, I sponsor two men who have had their teenage sons killed. Neither of them got thirsty. They'll probably grieve for the rest of their lives, but they did not get thirsty. They didn't drink. I, we've seen it all. We don't get thirsty. That's what happens. Uh, I want to close with a story from my, uh, my great teacher. was a fellow named Don from Denver. Many of you know who I'm talking about. And uh, I had the privilege of spending this last Thanksgiving with him. My wife and I were down the... And I was, he was the guy I could call with the unanswerable question. And you knew every time that when he talked, what you heard was principle-based and it was the answer I couldn't find on my own. And I was finally able to ask him. And he was, he was terminal and we knew it. And sitting, the girls are sitting like right here and we're sitting here and they didn't see this happen. I finally asked him this question. I said, Don, what are guys like Scott going to do? And guys like Don are all gone. And this humble giant cupped his hands, and he leaned, and he looked in there, and he said, I've been bringing you hands full of water. Go to the river. He said it wasn't him. That he had gained access to a power and a wisdom so far beyond his own through the process of those steps. And he believed that was available to me, and I believe it's available to all of us. And, uh, and I'd like to close what I think is the single most important thing to be said here this weekend. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. Thanks.